Thanks everyone for coming today um, and to IES for hosting this talk. I, um, as probably became clear in Akasimi's comments, I've done a lot of work on the so-called Global 1968, and this is the 50th anniversary of 1968, and so there's been a lot of activity around that. And um, I chose to speak on fascism today um, because, sadly, um, as I've seen alluded to, it's um, a burning issue at present, even more burning than the 50th anniversary of 1968. Um, so uh, fascism is in the news again two-thirds of a century after being rendered into a phenomenon of the political fringe by its role in war and genocide. Today, new forms of right-wing extremism are unmistakably trying to shove their way back onto the political stage on both sides of the Atlantic. And of course, fascism never went away, but we have to ask the question of what, it's propelled it, what, what has propelled it from the margins back to the center. And attempts to understand this phenomenon lead inevitably back to a question that has exercised social scientists and political commentators since fascism's original emergence. What is fascism after all? So when it originally appeared as a political movement in post-World War I Italy, fascism was confusing and contradictory. Its hodgepodge of ideas were hard to take seriously. It's no wonder that the socialist intellectual Angelo Tosca concluded to fascism that to define it was to write its history. There didn't seem to be any ideological there, there. If we regard Italian fascism's early history, we can see why. For all its talk about being a revolutionary force, a new synthesis of previously irreconcilable opposites, fascism was, from the beginning, coterminous with a campaign of terror against the left. The so-called squadristi, members of the military like squads centered around former members of Italy's wartime special forces, the so-called arditi or brave ones, launched what they called punitive expeditions against the left. They attacked trade, uni trade unions, socialist cooperatives, pulled socialist mayors out of their houses in the middle of the night for beatings, forced them to drink castor oil, sometimes murdered them. And in that respect, the origins of fascism corresponded to the darkest fantasies of the contemporary so-called alt-right. Um, we can see here, uh, this is an image of a t-shirt that's making the alt-right rounds, um, which depicts left, leftist activists being thrown from a helicopter. And this was uh, physical removal since 1973. The, the dictatorship in, in Chile was uh, founded in 1973 under Pinochet. And one of their practices was to kidnap left-wing activists, torture them, and then drug them and throw them out of a helicopter over the ocean. Um, so this, we see Pinochet at the top, make communists afraid of render aircraft again. And you can probably, possibly see from where you are that the heads of the uh, leftists being murdered uh, have little Antifa, red and black Antifa flags. So this, in, in America, in the context of what's going on in Brazil right now, where um, where the uh, candidate Bolsonaro, himself a supporter of torture under Brazil's military dictatorship, um, has recently um, made major gains in elections. And one of his one of the candidates from his party, Rodrigo Amorim, celebrated the recent murder of the leftist city councilwoman Mariel Franco, who was assassinated in March. And he wrote in social media, "Get ready, left wingers, your days are numbered if we're in charge." So this exterminationist impulse against the left is central to contemporary right-wing radicalism and also to classic fascism. I'm reminded here of the, um, of the uh, definition, uh, one definition of fascism by Robert Paxson, a well-known historian of fascism. Fascism is dictatorship against the left amidst popular enthusiasm. So we might ask, why a dictatorship against the left and why the enthusiasm? In post-World War, post War I Italy, contemporary observers noted the naked assertion of a class interest at work in the activity of the squads. That activity was aimed precisely against expressions of working class power, especially in the Po Valley agricultural regions, in Red Bologna, and other uh, regional seats. The squads typically included, alongside ex-Special Forces soldiers, 
the sons of doctors, lawyers, or dry goods merchants, keen to make sure that collective working class power did not impinge on bourgeois prerogatives of status and wealth accumulation. And so we don't have to agree with the 1935 Comintern definition of fascism. Fascism is the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist elements of finance capital, unquote, to see that early fascism, for all its pro-war and hyper-nationalist hysteria, was very much about making sure that economic power did not change hands. Of course, there's much more to fascism than that. The broader aim was both political and, we might say, spiritual. On the one hand, fascism wanted to beat back godless Asiatic Bolshevism, threatening European values of religiosity and patriotism. On the other, it wanted to defend the value of the war experience, the experience of World War I, to keep the war alive, as it were, as a transcendental source of values and virtues. And the goal of keeping the attitudes and techniques of war alive in civilian society dovetailed neatly with the goal of combating left-wing insurgencies. Now, this post-World post War I era is an era in which we see the fall of empires, the Ottoman, the Austro-Hungarian, the German, the Russian, societies chock full of unemployed officers and imperial officials with unsure borders and ethnic tension. It's an era of revolutions or attempted revolutions in Russia under the Bolsheviks, in Hungary under Bela Kuhn, in Italy in various attempted uprisings, and in Germany, in Bavaria, Berlin, and the Ruhr. The Russian Revolution, especially in its various copycats, <coughs> scared the European bourgeoisie in other countries, which began to contemplate other more drastic means of defense. With its desire to <coughs> keep the war alive, fascism fit the bill perfectly. So here I'd like to think of fascism as a type of social warfare, social in two senses. First, as the infusion of war's tactics and attitudes into society, and second, as an emphasis on the social value of war and its alleged virtues. So war is a positive good. This is central to fascism. <coughs> In Germany, you know, General Ludendorff became a far-right leader alongside Hitler. Field Marshal von Hindenburg became president. <coughs> Demobilized troops of the, of the Volunteer Corps, the Freikorps, Corps, pictured here. It became a rough analog to the Italian Arditi, the squads, and in the early post-war years, death squads assassinated those held responsible for losing the war, namely Jews and socialists. So it's no exaggeration to say that Nazism was founded on the desire to refight the war. And in Italy, the very idea of a so-called punitive expedition was cribbed directly from the war. The punitive expedition is to punish the enemy. In both countries, fascists received the active cooperation of the military. In Italy, squadrists often went on their missions in army trucks, sometimes led by active duty officers. In Germany, Hitler's deputy Ernst Röhm used his army contacts to obtain weapons stockpiles. And of course, also key aspects of the fascist, of fascist form and organization were drawn from the military, the party army, the marching columns, flags, uniforms, military ranks. And you can see here in this photograph of, um, this is, uh, you know, a circa 1919, eight, 1918, late 1918, 1919 um, street fighting um, where, um, you know, the whole panoply of, of, um, of uh, techniques and insignia from the trenches of the Great War are brought right into the heart of the German city, including uh, the um, armored car, the flamethrower, grenades, and so on and so forth. War was also central to fascist political analysis. Now, socialist movements had hopefully claimed in the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, that workers would not fight their brother workers. The worker had no country. But when war was declared, workers rushed to sign up for it in a wave of patriotic enthusiasm. And in Germany, the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, voted for war credits, that is, voted to fund the war. And this proved a point with important political consequences, that the idea of the nation was stronger than the idea of class in this post-war context, or in the, even the, I mean in the pre-war context and during the war as well. It was in this context, 
context that the Nazis could speak of a socialism of the trenches, that is a socialism that had no Marxist content but was based on manly comradeship and shared danger. Um, and this was connected with the idea that the masses would have to be nationalized, that is people who were active in the Socialist Party or the Communist Party, the trade unions would have to be brought under the rubric of the nation and taught to identify with the nation instead of with their class. This is a reason that Hitler could boast that he didn't socialize industry, he socialized people. He said, I socialize people. And this is what he meant by that. So there's a third component in the relationship of fascism to war and revolution. Fascism saw itself as revolutionary. And the fact that fascists felt they had to, to to claim revolutionary status for themselves was, was in part a product of the historical moment and as well as the personal biographies of, of uh, fascism's first leaders. You know, the po immediate post-war period, 1918-1919, was a moment of left-wing ascendance. The fascist ego rejected the charge that fascism merely propped up a dying old world against the forces of revolution. It proposed not a counter-revolution, but an alternative revolution. Fascism was supposed to be new, vital, and young. And you may know or recall that fascism in Italy was born in the debate about whether to enter the war in the first place. And this, this debate between interventionist and, and non-interventionist rent Italian society. And fascism was really born out of that. And, and you probably all know that Mussolini was a socialist. He was the editor of Avanti, the, you know, the Socialist Party newspaper. And he quit socialism and rejected Marxism precisely over the question of the war. He still styled himself a revolutionary because central to fascism was the idea that we are not the old guard who, the, of the dying 19th century who let us get involved in the war, even though we simultaneously liked the war. But there's a schism in the way of thinking about the war there. But fascism wants to think that it's new and vital and not steppy old conservatism. And of course, Mussolini was you know, joined by revolutionary uh, syndicalists who had been in the left and who had kind of embraced the idea of the national myth, um, influenced by Sorel and so on, um, and also by avant-garde artists like the members of the, of the Futurist group, and the most famous Futurist is F.T. Marinetti, who continued to double down on his fascism um, and even fought on the Russian front in the Second World War um, for a brief period. But in the Futurist Manifesto, um, Marinetti writes, we want to sing the love of danger, the habit of energy and rashness, the essential elements of our poetry will be courage, audacity, and revolt. We want to exalt movements of aggression, feverish sleeplessness, the forced march, the perilous leap, the slap and the blow with the fist. So there's this whole, di this whole idea of regenerative um, violence that has a revolutionary connotation, and of course it's also extremely um, you know, misogynist. He talks about uh, the war as being the only cure for the world, and we want to stamp out uh, feminism. Uh, he explicitly mentions feminism as something that, that, that his new poetry wants to eliminate. Um, so, there are these revolutionary aspirations. Of course, these end in fire and ash for fascists, um, and, but fascism did not go away after 1945. Its brand was obviously tarnished by the war. It had to go underground disguising its aims. There's a reason why Holocaust denial is so central to the development of the radical rights in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, because they m might want to own many things, but typically fascists did not want to own the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So they denied that it happened, but they but held to other goals, continue to hold to other goals. And the, the fas fascist thesis also called into life its antithesis. Um, not only wartime and immediate post-war anti-fascism, which was extremely strong uh, in, into the war because there were anti-fascist militias, you know, obviously fighting in France and Italy and various places, um, but also in the left-wing student movements that really get going at the beginning of the 1960s, which sought to root out fascist personnel and structures of thought, and also contempor uh, interpreted contemporary events through the lens of recent history. And the American War in Vietnam obviously was, was very important in this regard, and um, you can see this in a, in, a, in a photograph I've shown in this room before, which is a, a protest in uh, 1967 in West Berlin, and you can see that the ruined shell of the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church is in the, is in the background, which was left in place as a reminder of the dangers of war and fascism, 
And you can also see this woman holding the sign in which, in which you see Vietnamese peasants behind barbed wire in a strategic hamlet. And it says U.S. out of Vietnam, and the S in USA has been transformed into the runic S of the Nazi SS. So there's like this um, argument by, by a visual metaphor um, suggesting that current crimes are recapitulations of, of classic fascism. In Italy, many Mussolini-era laws remained in place, as did fascist regional administrators and chiefs of police. The early post-war years saw the emergence of, neo uh, of a neo-fascist party, the so-called Common Man's Front, which was subsequently absorbed into the first major neo-fascist party to emerge in Western Europe, which was the Italian Social Movement. Numerous Italian fascists were recruited by the CIA in a secret stay-behind army codenamed Gladio, or S.W.O.R.D., which was founded in 1956 with branches across Western Europe. And this program was organized to undermine communism by any means necessary, up to and including terror attacks on civilian targets. And in a notable instance, Gladio played a key role in the, the coup of the Greek, Greek colonels in April 1967. In West Germany, for obvious reasons, the persistence of fascist personnel and attitudes became a central lens for examining current social conflicts. And this wasn't really based on a fantasy because former Hitler supporters remained lodged in important positions in government and the professions. Um, and in 1952, there was an abortive early neo-Nazi movement, which was called the Socialist Reich Party, um, which was banned. Then there was a, another party founded in 1964, the NPD, uh, so like 12 years later, which continues to exist today, the National Democratic Party. And Nazis continue to, uh, former Nazis continue to occupy positions in West German law, academia, and government, while a younger generation of neo-Nazis trained in terror tactics. And we now know that the assassin of the student leader, the, the would-be assassin of the student leader, Rudi Duchka, in uh, West Germany was, uh, had connections to these far-right circles. He was not just a crazy disgruntled kid, but in fact was training in weapons with neo-Nazis. So this creation of far-right groups took place against a Europe-wide backdrop of increased <coughs> immigration. So in England, the National Front was also founded in 1967 became a focus of working class recruiting efforts and was associated with street gangs involved in anti-immigrant <coughs> attacks. In France, we saw the founding of groups like the Delta Commandos, Christian West, and Youth Front, and the group Occident was uh, a force on university campuses in 1968. Also, um, a, a more well-known and long-lasting group, Jean-Marie Le Pen's National Front, was founded in 1972. And even in Spain, where there was nominally a you know fascist dictatorship still in place under Frank Franco, although it wasn't really you know it was more uh, extreme right and less fascist. Um, even there, there were new groups founded in, in the 1970s, like Guerrillas of Christ the King or Commandos of the Anti-Marxist Struggle. So after 1945, fascism was not exactly a fringe phenomenon, but it was difficult for it to assume the opus openness it has in our present moment. I think everyone in this room knows that far-right movements are currently gaining ground in Europe and outside Europe. In Germany, Austria, Hungary, France, Sweden, England, Poland, Brazil, the Philippines, and of course the United States. And that's a far from a complete list. And the general tenor of some of these groups is captured in the name of a group like uh, Germany, Germany's Pegida, an acronym for Patriotic Europeans Against the Islamicization of the West. So Islam, indeed, and immigration more generally, is a new rallying point for right-wing populism, seen not only in the rise of parties and politicians, but in the reemergence of right-wing street violence from Chemnitz to Charlottesville. When speaking about these groups, however, we have to be careful about labeling all expressions of right-wing populism as fascism. So briefly, I'd like to just touch on how scholars have talked about that. And of course, to, to talk about how scholars have talked about that would require a series of uh, half-hour talks. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of things uh, that I think are important for our purposes today. Uh, Roger Griffin is one of the leading, has been over the last 20 years, one of the leading historians. Uh, and theorist of fascism, and he defines fascism 
as a genus of political ideology whose mythic core and its various permutations is a palingenetic form of populist ultranationalism. He really wanted to get this down into one sentence, which he did. <laughs> uh, and I laud, I laud the, the, the analytic effort here. Um, he, so basically, though I think this, this is, is received some criticism, but it's also been widely um, you, you know, accepted or accepted with modifications. But basically, the focus on myth, the idea that it's a movement that has a mythic core, which suggests the, 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 the critical status of myth in, in the movement. A palingenesis, he used the word uh, palingenetic, palingenetic form, palingenesis uh, pertains to rebirth, to rebirth. So for example, the idea of, of MAGA, you know, uh, is, is the idea of rebirth. Something was, was great, but now it's degenerated and it has to be made great again. Populism, that's clear, um, drawing in the people, but not in an informed left-wing way, but in a more amorphous uh, populist way, and then, of course, ultranationalism, because fascism is not, a, is not in any way a movement of the left, but a movement that focuses on the primacy of the, of the nation, and sometimes also on race. So scholars have been, have been insistent on the need to differentiate fascism from, plain old, from, from the plain old radical right. Um, according to such analyses, um, the radical right lacks the desire to construct a totalizing, revolutionary, dictatorial alternative to liberal democracy. So according to these analyses, if, you're, if you don't want to do those things, if you're, if you're content on some level to work within democratic institutions, you are ipso facto not a fascist. Um, and in our current moment, I must confess that I'm not so interested as I used to be in fine distinctions between fascism and the radical right, or the populist right. It's important to note that it was precisely the conservative right and the radical right who helped fascists gain power in Europe in the interwar period. So I propose that we allow ourselves some definitional imprecision at this moment, mm -hmm. that instead of narrowing down on endlessly debated set of core fascist characteristics, um, we widen our gaze to take in the broader set of relationships that lead us to our current situation of danger. Now, of course, we can speak of actual widely acknowledged fascists now, uh, like Golden Dawn in Greece, it was clearly a, a fascist group in, in every way. They would tick all Roger Griffin's boxes and all Stanley Payne's boxes and so on and so forth. And we can also speak of right-wing populism, of, of the Trumpian variety, or of what's going on in Hungary right now, um, and what's going on with the off day in Germany. But all these permutations pose a danger. In, in the aftermath of events like the event in Charlottesville, you know, we have to keep in mind that these groups see themselves as potential allies, if not actual allies. So to, to focus too much on the distinctions can, can, uh, can be analytically dangerous. Um, of course, any new concatenation of extreme right-wing forces is going to be different than what existed between the world wars. And there's a, there's a, a, tr a trend in some of the older <coughs> fascism scholarship that said we can only talk about fascism when fascism actually existed between 1919 and 1945. And I think most of us have moved away from that, and I certainly re reject that. Um, one thing that's interesting is that classical fascism took itself seriously. It predated youth subcultures celebrity culture and the internet. Um, we did not see in classical fascism the sneer combined with the wink, the Hollywoodization of right-wing extremism, if you will, the, the whole, the whole you know, alt-right internet culture with Pepe the Frog and all that. Um, and, and, and I also can't help thinking about a classic historiographical debate about the role of Hitler. One of Hitler's earliest biographers, Sir Alan Bullock, regarded Hitler as a man without ideology, as a, as a mountebank, a con man. Mm -hmm. um, and later scholars have moved away from that and insisted that no, Hitler was, you know, he had a core set of ideas that he took very seriously and he infused these ideas through his movement and he acted accordingly. Um, now with some of the people who are at the head of extreme nationalist movements these days, this con man thesis uh, makes a lot more sense, right? There's a definite, um, I won't mention any names, but there seems to be a lack of ideas in certain quarters. And I think we can say that classical fascism was much less concerned with getting likes um, than it was with um, act en enacting radical programs. Um, but even the Hollywood version of right-wing extremism brings great danger. 
Fascism was not just a brutal dictatorship over the working class. It was, at its most dangerous, an attempt to co-opt the working class into a project through which it received rights and benefits. These rights and benefits, however, could only come at the expense of someone else. There had to be an out-group to allow the in-group to have the rights and benefits. And this was true of classical fascism, and it's also true of the contemporary radical right, or populist right. In the case of the Nazis, this out-group was first and foremost the Jews, but it also included a host of other categories, from the Sinti and Roma, to homosexuals, to the mentally and physically challenged, to socialists and communists. Now, Donald Trump's former advisor, Steve Bannon, realizes fully what fascism had to do and what it needs to do now to be successful. He's argued that globalism has, quote-unquote, gutted the American working class. And at the beginning of the Trump presidency, Bannon made the following prediction. He said, if we deliver, we'll get 60% of the white vote and 40% of the black and Hispanic vote, and we'll govern for 50 years. And what he means is, if we deliver on the economic quality of life aspect of the, of the twofold fascist offering that has to also come with the demonization of outgroups, so immigrants, primarily in this case. And Trump didn't follow Bannon's advice to our relief, because if he did, it would, he would eliminate a lot of the opposition to himself, as, um, as uh, Bannon predicted. So for many people, Trump was a protest vote, and this was true for the Nazis as well. One of the most important anal analysts of Nazi uh, electoral politics called the NSDAP a catch-all party of protest. But the Nazis knew what, they ha knew what to do with the power they gained because they actually had an ideology. Self-aggrandizement is not an ideology. But powerful elements of the fascist mixture are here today if we know where to look. There's a sense of lost greatness, a reemergence of political violence, the primacy of war and warriors, it's all there. And you can look back over American history of the last 20 years and see signs of this emerging um, uh, set of factors. I think of something like the so-called Brooks Brothers riots during the 2004 electoral recount where Republican operatives were shipped in to physically prevent the recount. Um, the stab in the back myth about the Vietnam War. You may recall that the mo one of the most important fascist mythologies in Weimar Germany was around the idea that the German fighting man had not actually lost the war, but in fact had been stabbed in the back from the home front by Jews and socialists. So this functions in movies like the Rambo movies of the 1980s in which the, you know, they wouldn't let us win. We were, the stab in the back myth is central to the historical coming to terms with the Vietnam War. The ubiquitous MIA flags and the little ribbon culture support our troops and make America great again. Above all, however, we have a twofold crisis. It's a crisis of white identity, which is captured in the slogan that was chanted in Charlottesville that you will not replace us or Jews will not replace us, and simultaneously a crisis of masculinity. And this twofold crisis is constructed with respect to a twofold enemy Islam and immigrants on the outside, and leftist radicals on the inside, or liberals busily working to destroy from within. So one's reminded of Marx's uh, statement about um, history being re repeated the second time as farce, when we think about right-wing commentators like Jonah Goldberg, who in his 2007 liberal fascism argued that that fascism is not a phenomenon of the right at all, it has always been a phenomenon of the left. Or Dinesh D'Souza's 2017 book, The Big Lie, exposing the Nazi roots of the American left. And it would be easy to see this as a farcical historical recapitulation. How can the right see the left as such a threat at a moment when the left has never been weaker and the right never more ascendant? But if we see this would-be counter-revolution in the context of broader social changes, it makes more sense. In particular, it's a response to the activism of the 1960s, which put the claims of women, LGBTQ, people of color, and so on, firmly in the national agenda. And there's another angle, though, that's economic. 
You know, the issues of the day are radical Islam, immigrants, whiteness, gender, but there's a strong admixture of economic anxiety fueling the rise of right-wing populism. And here we can go back to Steve Bannon. For all that Trump, for all that Trump and others like him tap veins of racism and gender anxiety for their support, we cannot forget that in some cases he won states that had twice voted for Barack Obama. One of the most disquieting features of our present moment is the way in which radical right-wing movements in Europe and America have made themselves beneficiaries of widespread anger about neoliberal globalization. The liberal establishment in both Europe and America has been shocked by widespread resistance to the neoliberal consensus that it has done so much itself to put in place. And on the right, paradoxically, the ration of the crisis of capitalism focuses its anger, as we've seen, on various perceived challenges to white identity, like immigration, and um, the threat of a, of a, a violent radical left of right-wing fantasy. And this development should come as no surprise to the student of interwar fascism. It has, however, shattered easy assumptions about the triumph of capitalism in place since 1989. So people like Steve Bannon want to build a new consensus, a kind of right-wing New Deal, based both on redress of economic distress and racial cultural animosity. This is the strategy that the Nazis successfully employed between 1933 and 1939. Um, Bev and I were talking about Sebastian Hoffner earlier, um, and I was reminded of, of uh, something he says in his book, The Meaning of Hitler. He said that if Hitler had died in 1938, he would have been regarded as the greatest German statesman of all time. In other words, if he had, been, if he had died before he lost the Second World War and, and the Holocaust, he would have been forgiven for the boycott of Jewish businesses in April 1933 and all the other early outrages of the regime. Fighting the global rise of the populist right coalition, a coalition that includes committed fascists among its ranks, is going to take the building of, a, of an alternative consensus, one that seeks redress of economic distress in a more thoroughgoing way, and at the same time combines that redress not with the persecution of outgroups, but with the humanistic politics of democratic values that are not just political, but economic and social. And it can't just, the social, the social element can't just be talk. For example, it's not enough to emphasize a cosmopolitan hope and change without providing the material basis for it. Unless serious steps are taken to provide a decent life for all people, to privilege the social, to insist, contra Margaret Thatcher, that there is such a thing as a society, as opposed to simply a collection of competing interests in the marketplace, we will not see the end of fascism anytime soon. So with that, I'll stop. So we have time for questions. <laughs>